Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is I want to look a little bit at little g. All right, little g, you probably are familiar with it. It's the acceleration due to gravity. And if you've taken any physics class, you should know that if you're on the surface of the Earth, the value is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, that's if you're on the surface of the Earth. Now what happens if you wanted to go through the Earth? All right, one way of doing it would be to dig a hole right through the center of the Earth. Right, if I wanted to travel all the way to this other side, right, what would happen to little g at that point? Right? It's no longer 9.8 because I'm no longer on the surface of the Earth. How can I calculate little g if I'm somewhere inside? So this is what we're going to do now. We have to make an approximation. First of all, digging through the center of the Earth is way too complicated, right? Because the Earth has way too many layers to it. And that makes the problem way too complicated. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a simplified model of the Earth. We're going to represent it by a single sphere. Okay, and we're going to dig a tiny hole right through the center. Now our sphere is going to have, guess what, the same mass as the Earth and it's going to have the same radius. Okay, we'll call it radius of the Earth. So let's have a look now. What happens when I jump through this hole? Okay, when I jump through the hole, here's what the cross section looks like. I will start to fall. There is still a force of gravity acting on me. Uh, I wanna know what is little g, for example, when I'm halfway, when I'm at the center. All right, and what kind of motion am I going to do now as I travel through this, uh, this planet? All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. All right, let's get started with this problem. All right, let's first consider the case now when I'm outside of this planet, right? So I'm located a certain distance away from the center of that planet, and I'm just going to denote that distance as being the uppercase R. Now, when I'm on the outside, there is a force acting on me, right? There is a force of gravity, which I call Fg, and this I can use Newton's law of gravity in order to calculate that force. Right, the value of this force of gravity, let's just stick to black here. Uh, the force of gravity, uh, Fg, is simply big G, the universal gravitational constant. Uh, the mass of the man, uh, the mass of the planet Earth, okay, I'll just call it Me, and divided by this distance squared. Now, we also call this the weight, right? Uh, when you're close to the surface of the Earth, we call this M multiplied by little g. Now, if you look at this expression, we have the mass of the man on both sides. Uh, you can factor that out. Okay, we're left now with an expression for little g. And this is valid anywhere as long as I'm on the outside of the planet. Okay, and I could also be on the surface, right? If you want to actually just place the guy right here on the surface, the only thing I change now is that I'm going to get the value right on the Earth, right? Because I'm going to have big G, the mass of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth squared. In this case, if I take my data over here and I substitute it into this equ equation, this is where I'm going to get my 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, at any other position when I'm on the outside, you see that I'm going to be dividing by a larger number because R in this case is going to be bigger than the radius of the Earth. The radius of the Earth is right here. All right, so if I'm farther away from the surface, right, if I'm out in space, I'm dividing by a larger number, I will get a value of little g that is less than 9.8. Okay, so little g, really when you're on the outside, is proportional to one over r squared. The bigger you make the radius, or the distance from the center of the Earth, the smaller little g gets. All right, now let's go see what happens now if I jump through this tunnel. Right, if I jump through this tunnel, I'm no longer at the surface, and this equation here no longer applies. So let's go see what the equation looks like inside, the, uh, inside that planet. All right, we now want to find what is little g now when I am traveling toward the center of the Earth. We know the value at the surface, and we know the value anywhere on the outside of the sphere, right? But what happens now if my distance is less than or equal to the radius of the Earth? So this is no longer the expression over here. All right, so in order to get what uh, little g is at any position, for example, right here, um, what you have to do is, there's two ways of doing it. There's one way that is called Gauss's Law. This is a slightly more mathematical, and it's going to be the topic of another video. Uh, instead, we're going to do something a little bit simpler, okay? I'm just going to write it down. Now, little g at any position, okay, again, it depends on big G. Now, it's not dependent on the total mass of the Earth. It's actually only dependent on how much mass is actually on the inside, and I'll explain that in just a second. 
And it again is an inverse squared relationship divided by the distance to the center squared. So let's imagine this case here. I've jumped through this hole and I'm starting to travel toward the center of the earth. I am a certain distance little r away from the center. So that's little r that appears down here in the denominator. Now, how much mass is on the inside? Again, you have to imagine now a sphere that has a radius r, okay? Uh, how much mass is actually located just inside this dashed line? Not the entire planet. The entire planet we know has a total mass equal to the mass of the Earth. But how would I find how much mass is actually just here inside the dashed line? That is the value that goes right here. Now, one thing you notice is that this expression is valid if I'm on the surface. If I'm on the surface, how much mass is on the inside? What's well, the total mass of the Earth? And what is my position? In that case, it would simply be the radius of the Earth. So the expression here also holds at the surface. But it's true for any position here inside the planet. So this is what we have to use. So how do you calculate the mass? For this, we're going to use the concept of density. Okay, uh, The density is simply the mass multiplied by the volume. Okay, So how much mass then is on the inside? Well, let's keep every other term the same. So the amount of mass on the inside, you can see I can write mass as the density of the planet multiplied by the volume. Okay, So this would be the density multiplied by the volume. And this is the volume of the inside. It's not the total volume. So how much volume here? Again, you have to think about a sphere. So the volume of a sphere, if you remember, is 4 thirds pi r cubed, right? That is the volume of this dash sphere. Let's go ahead and substitute that value right inside our expression here. So we get big G over little r squared. We get the density of the planet. And now I'll open up kind of a big bracket. This will be 4 thirds pi little r cubed. All right, this is a very important relationship. You can see you have little r squared here and I have r cubed. I can get rid of two of those and cancel it out with the denominator term. All right, this expression looks a little bit messy, but we're going to clean it up in just a minute here. So let's put out all the terms. So we have big G, we have the density of our planet. We have 4 thirds pi and we only have one value of r left. All right, and our last expression, what we're going to do, well, again, what I've assumed here is that the density is that this is a solid object, this entire planet. How would you write the density of the planet? Well, you can write it as the mass of the Earth divided by the total volume of the Earth. That's how you can write the density. And the total volume, I'd have 4 thirds pi. And now if I'm looking at the total volume, I'd have radius of the Earth cube. All right, well, let's go ahead and substitute that here for the density. So we're almost done here. So we have big G for the density rho. I'm going to write mass of the earth uh, divided by 4 thirds pi radius of the earth cube. And now we just simply write all the remaining terms. We still had a 4 thirds from before and pi multiplied by R. Now all we have to do is clean this expression up. Those 4 thirds are going to cancel. And now my final expression for little g anywhere uh, inside this planet looks like this. So it's big G, mass of the Earth, divided by, in this case, look at it's radius of the Earth cube. But don't forget, I still need to multiply by the distance little r. And that's how far I am away from the center of the planet. All right, this is our expression for little g everywhere inside this planet. All right, have a look. Does this expression work if I'm on the surface of the Earth? Well, here all you have to do is substitute this little r for the radius of the Earth, and you can see we're going to get to the same expression as we previously had. All right, let's make a sketch here of what is going on with this problem. All right, so if we were going to make a sketch of what little g looks like as a function of distance from the center, well, we can go all the way, for example, to the radius of the Earth. All right, if I plot um, radius of the Earth right here, now, the expression I use is the one I just found, and that is a linear relationship, right? So this will go all the way to the value equal to 9.8. That's at the surface. And it should be a straight line once I get all the way to the radius of the Earth. After that, as I'm going farther away from the center, right, as my distance r gets bigger, again, now little g rolls off and gets smaller until I go all the way to infinity where little g is zero. So in this section, right, in this section here, we get something that is proportional to the distance. 
And in this section here, I get an expression for little g that is inversely proportional to the distance squared. Okay, this is what happens to little g. Let's now look at the motion of this guy as he's traveling through this tunnel. All right, let's try to analyze this motion a little bit. So again, we're starting over here on the surface. We know little g at the surface uh, is 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, I start to fall, right? My velocity actually initially is zero. Right, so what happens? I start off slow and then I, what, I start speeding up. I can make those vectors bigger and bigger. As I go through the origin, I'm actually going the fastest that I'm ever going to go. Because once I go past the center here of this planet, guess what happens? The acceleration then changes direction. So let's plot the acceleration here in black. As I get closer, again, the acceleration depends on the distance. Right, so it actually gets smaller. Right here, the acceleration at the center is zero. And then what happens? The acceleration actually flips around, right? It's always toward the center, right? Because the force of gravity is an attractive force. So this is what we get. And once I'm right back on the other side, my acceleration is still 9.8, the magnitude, but the direction is flipped. So what happens to the speed? I have V max when I go through the midpoint. And then what? Then it starts slowing down because the acceleration is in the opposite. Once I get to the other side, guess what? My speed is zero again. So let's try to analyze this uh, with respect to um, using an equation of motion. So imagine we define r here. We'll start at zero. Uh, positive r will be in this direction, okay? And negative r is going to be pointing down, okay? It's kind of a just 1D motion, right? You see you're simply going to oscillate back and forth. All right, well, let's go ahead and write down Newton's second law for this. Newton's second law says you add up all the forces, they have to be equal to mass times acceleration. In this case, there's only one force, it's the force of gravity, it's mg, except little g now takes on this value, it's not a constant value. Now, I will put a negative sign here, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. First of all, the mass of the guy kind of cancels out. Let's go ahead and finish this, this is minus. Now I'm gonna just substitute our value here for g. Big G, mass of the Earth, divided by radius of the Earth cube, and this is simply a constant, and multiplied by the distance away from the origin. All right, now look at this value. So I have a negative sign, that's because my acceleration is always opposite, right? If R is positive up here, uh, acceleration is toward the center. When R is negative over here, the acceleration is pointing up, that is the positive direction, right? So we say that this force of gravity here is simply a restoring force, right? It's always pointing toward the center of the planet. This is the exact equation now for a simple harmonic oscillator. All right, and that is simple, something that simply oscillates back and forth, okay? Uh, simple harmonic motion. That's all I will do when I have this, right? You start off zero, you speed up till you hit the maximum value, then you go to the other side and where my speed is going to be zero. So how do you actually prove this? Well, for this, you have to remember that the acceleration here is going to be, it's the second derivative of the position, right? In this case, we're talking about the letter R. So acceleration is the second derivative of the distance, right? How does that rate of change? So, and then we simply write down this whole term. And then what we need to do now is find a solution to this equation, okay? This is a second order differential equation. Now, that's a big complicated word, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give you what the solution is. And the way that you can check out the solution is simply to substitute the value inside here. So this is what the solution looks like. So the distance from the center as a function of time is going to be given by this value. So initially I'm on the radius of the Earth, and since I'm starting out here with zero initial speed, it's actually pretty straightforward. All right, it's cos of omega t, and omega is uh, an angular frequency. Now let's go ahead and substitute that equation inside here. So I have to take the second derivative of this. Now if you take the second derivative of a cosine, you end up getting a cosine again, but there's a negative in the front. And actually the argument here that multiplies the time ends up coming out twice. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this is what the second derivative of this function looks like with respect to time. If you substitute that up here, what you end up getting now is what value of omega you need in order for this to be a solution to my equation here that I've boxed up. So what we end up getting here is that my omega squared value has to be equal to that constant, gme 
over the radius of the Earth squared. All right, now what is omega? Omega is our angular frequency. Now, if you've, again, if you've done a little bit of physics, uh, you should know that it is related to just the linear frequency, which we call f. That is our value of omega, and we have to square that value. And again, the linear frequency now, that is something we measure in hertz. This is also related to the period, because one over the period gives me the frequency. So I can use this expression and substitute it into here. All right, and the reason I'm doing this is because we're actually going to get the period of oscillation. How long does it take you to do one full trip? Okay, it takes you a certain amount of time to go uh, from here to here, and it takes you the same amount of time to go back, right? And if you do one full trip, this is what we call the period of oscillation of this motion. So let's go ahead now on the next page and get our final expression for the period. All right, the last step I wanna do now is just get a final expression for the period. Uh, if I expand this squared term, I get four pi squared multi, uh, divided by the period squared. Now, how do I get the period by itself? Well, you can bring it on the other side. You have to do a little bit of algebra here, but let's rearrange this here. So period squared then is equal to uh, four pi squared radius of the earth cube divided by g and multiplied by mass of the earth. Uh, to get rid of the square term, all you have to do is simply take the square root of both sides. And guess what? We get our final expression here for the period. Again, the time to go there and the time to come back. That is the total period of the motion. Now, if I substitute all my values here, remember, we know what mass of the Earth is. We know what the radius of the Earth. We get a period that's approximately equal to 5,063 seconds. Okay, this is, again, if you just divide through by 60, gives me approximately 84.4 minutes in order to do this round trip, right? So you're going pretty fast once you hit this center in order to kind of travel this huge distance, right? Which is, you know, the diameter, you have to do that two times in 84 minutes. All right, it actually turns out that this result here is the exact same amount of time it would take for you to go around the Earth in a low Earth orbit. Now, a low Earth orbit is something defined as, again, if you're close to the surface of the Earth and you want to go around this entire planet, right, do one full turn, the amount of time it would take you in order to accomplish that um, in a low Earth orbit uh, would be approximately 84.4 minutes, right? It's quite a remarkable result. Take you the same amount of time that if you just dug a tunnel, fell through, and then came all the way back. Okay, anyway, that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching.